Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Podcast Academy's Masterclass on Programming for Latino Audiences. I'm Amanda, the Education Director, and I will be monitoring the chat for questions. And you also, if you're a live attendee, can submit them through the Q&A box. The Podcast Academy is a thousand strong community across the world, virtual, multilingual, which you'll hear about a little bit in a minute. If you're not yet a TPA member, but you're a live attendee, we will be sending you a thank you code for attending and participating for 50% off your first year. And um, if you have any questions, you can certainly email me. I will put my email into the chat momentarily. TPA members, you will be able to see this on demand later. We post it within about two business days on the member portal. Um, and if you are curious about the benefits of TPA, I just wanted to mention it's AMBI's season, AMBI's Awards for Excellence in Audio. Nominations are closing on the 18th you are absolutely encouraged to submit. Please fight off that so-called imposter syndrome. Everybody's voice is valid and we want to celebrate it. That's why they were uh, produced by the Podcast Academy in 2020. It's now my pleasure to get us started on this TPA Masterclass. And I want to welcome and thank our wonderful panel moderator, uh, Martha Little. Um, Martha brings more than 25 years of audio experience to Audible and uh, Amazon company, I believe. As Senior Director for Creative Development, she's worked at major um, podcasts, I'm sorry, in public radio outlets, NPR, um, APM, PRI, was the news <laughs> director at WBUR. And um, her work's been recognized by such awards as the Peabody. You know, I won't embarrass you, Martha, but you're awesome, obviously. <laughs> um, and no need, no need. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're also grateful to have Martha's expertise in docudrama, series of scripted fiction, etc. Um, on the Podcast Academy board. So without further ado, Martha, how are you doing? Thanks for being I'm, here. I'm great, after, especially after that intro. Gosh, that was amazing. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Uh, well, just thank you very, so much. Very, Let me turn it over to you. Sure, sure. Very excited to be here today. Um, I should make one note, which is uh, I was schooled on Latino versus Latin American uh, audiences. So we want to make sure we use our language correctly here. And we're going to address both, I would think, and probably more um, terms uh, in this panel. I want to start, kick it off with uh, Manny Moravite. He's the head of Spanish language and in-culture English language content at Audible. Uh, welcome. Uh, Martina Castro is a longtime friend of mine and love to see her. Um, she, her is founded, uh, her pronouns are she, her, his pronouns are he, him, I should say. Um, she's the founder and CEO of Adonde Media and a new acquaintance, Camilla Victoriano, as I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, you got uh, it. <laughs> thank God. Uh, she, uh, she, her are her pronouns, and she is the co-founder of Sonoro. It's really wonderful to see you guys together. Um, so, Manny, I'm going to kick it off with you. And what I understand is that who is your target audience is kind of a very key element here in, in answering first before we dive into some of the complexities. So, so tell us why that makes a huge difference. It's a very uh, diverse audience within specifically within the US. And I think there's some pitfalls in terms of programming overall when you try to do a, a, a cast a wide net because uh, Latinos, Latine, Latinas, Hispanics, come from all kinds of uh, different regions in Latin America, at least potentially their parents do. So they have different types of ancestry. There's content that they gravitate towards. So if you're programming for somebody that's listening to something in the US, there are some common threads, but you don't really wanna fall into tropes, et cetera. Uh, and if you're programming for Latin American audiences, that's a completely different thing because now you're programming for countries. So determining who your target audience is really important before you start to produce something and to see who you want to reach specifically. Is it Mexican Americans or Colombian Americans? Is it a larger theme about what Latinos, Latinas, Latin A audiences may or may not want to consume? And specifically, what language do you want to do it in? Uh, since I work on the content acquisition and distribution side, I want to hand it off to my, uh, my colleagues to speak a little bit about that because they're actually on the production side. So um, if you don't mind, I'll just have Martina go ahead and speak to what 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 she thinks that the target audience maybe. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, so yeah, it's such an interesting quandary because <laughs> so many people want 
um, to target Latino audiences, Latinx audiences, and what does that really mean? Um, and uh, something that was really illuminating for me was participating in the Edison Research Latino Podcast Listener Report that's now in its third year. Um, and you can see how you slice and dice this community really uh, impacts how they listen. And so, uh, for example, I actually pulled up some slides just to give people a little bit of context here. Um, among monthly U.S. Latino podcast listeners, 48% are U.S. born first generation. And um, then you've got smaller uh, chunks that are born outside of the U.S., second generation U.S. born or U.S. born third generation. And of course, that you know, filters down into how, how and why you listen. Are you listening in English versus uh, listening in Spanish? And so um, at Adonde, we make podcasts for multicultural and multilingual audiences. Um, what's really interesting right now is where we are with Spanish language podcasting in general. So everything Manny said is right. Everything that the uh, listener report says is interesting and right. You're going to be targeting different people with your content based on who you actually want to be talking to. So for example, if I really want to talk to younger second or third generation Latinos in the United States, I'm probably going to make something in Spanglish or in English um, because many uh, do not speak Spanish and are not Spanish dominant, even if they do speak it at home. Um, but in Spanish language podcasting, and I think Camila might, I'm curious what you think about this. It's just so young that at this point, if I'm making something based in Latin America, well, our first original was based in Buenos Aires, um, and it was really well received in Spain, in Mexico, in Colombia. And that's because it was like a true crime documentary about a really famous bank heist, um, kind of very similar to Money Heist, which was also a big hit. And we rode the coattails of that. And it just so happens right now, there's so little content and it's so um, still like diversifying that if it's good and it's interesting, you can actually get a wide swath of Latinos and Latin Americans. Um, so it's it's kind of so early days that, you know, yeah, maybe Spaniards prefer to listen to podcasts with their own accent. And same goes for maybe Mexicans or Argentinians. But if something's really engaging, they're going to listen. And that's just because it's a, still an emerging market. Yeah, I mean, I'll just second everything that, you know, Manny and Martina have said so far. And and to answer sort of your question, I mean, I think how Sonoro thinks about our target audience is that it's global, right? The biggest sort of view of who we're targeting when we make a great show is just podcast listeners around the world. Obviously, like our core sort of bread and butter audience that we're really working with on the creator side and sort of trying to serve on the audience side are Latinos, both in the US and mainly those, um, as Martina said, the second and third generations that are listening most likely in English um, and listeners in Latin America with a special focus on Mexico for our content. But I think ultimately like a great story is a great story. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up Money Heist. I mean, we've seen this in, in streaming already with Money Heist, with Lupin, with call your agent, um, like people are list, are just watching things and listening to things because they're great. And I think obviously audio has the um, additional challenge that subtitles they are not <laughs> quite uh, use, used for us yet. So we sometimes have to produce things in many languages at the same time to sort of get that same effect. But I think more and more so with people just looking for really great stories that are human. And while they're locally specific to where they're taking place in terms of um, how people are speaking in terms of slang and language, ultimately they're gonna have universal themes. And I think when we work with our with our creators in particular on, on the scripted side, when we're making fiction series, we're really just leaning on them to tell the story that they wanna tell, be it sci-fi, drama, rom-com, um, whatever. and and just trusting that like their lived experience as Latinos, wherever they may be from, will come across in that story in, in that most authentic way. And I think will resonate maybe especially well with that Latino community that we're targeting, but I think beyond that as well. Can we, um, it might be helpful for the audience to understand sort of the, each of your uh, sphere of influence or you know who you, who you do target. Uh, Manny, why don't you begin there? Well, um, overall, what I was, um, brought on to do was to create a catalog for our future services in Latin America. So I was doing a lot of licensing and um, acquiring content from Latin American content creators. 
simultaneously Audible launched a uh, customer user experience that we called Audible Latino. And it wasn't another service as part of our member service. It was just a customer experience that allowed for better discovery of our existing titles. So those of you that are not as familiar with Audible, we are a legacy audiobook company. And as such, we have a, a acclimated customer that is used to a certain kind of narrative. So that was an interesting journey to find a narrative that wasn't a huge departure from the customer experience at that time, which was an audiobook. And in fact, a lot of my early productions and the reviews were like, I love this audiobook. And, you know, wasn't an audiobook, but that takes some uh, a level of education. As we saw engagement numbers increase in the US, we knew that there was had always been an audience and an adjustable market uh, with the US Latino, Latin A, Latina audiences. Uh, we were just pleasantly surprised by how much they were consuming some of the original content that was in Spanish. So we didn't necessarily shift our strategy. We just expanded it to start talking to a lot of creators that were based in the U.S. and understood the nuances of what the Latina, Latin A, uh, Latino experience is because there are significant differences and started making adjustments to some of the content that we would produce. In fact, I, I mean, as of a couple of years ago, we we're doing a lot of productions that we called our simple, simultaneous publications in English and in Spanish, which are not just translations, they're adaptations, localizations. There are sometimes shifts in the way that we do settings, uh, in even in the way that the content, the episodes are ordered just to make it feel more relevant. So it's been a journey and we continue to learn from the audience Fortunately, as being an Amazon company, we have access to data that allows us to see the consumption that allows us to also create for a lot of the audiences. Like my counterparts can speak about this, but for example, a big category for us is self-development and we're seeing it in Latin America grow. It doesn't feel like it's quote unquote as sexy as fiction uh, or multicast, but people absolutely love consuming it. And because we have a different type of acclimation and a different type of listener, their format is not one that that they would respond to if it was something on a free platform. Mm -hmm. um, Great. So, thank you, Martina. How about you? What's your sphere of influence? So, um, Adonis, in its fifth year, um, it started out as a production company, service based. Um, you know, making a podcast for clients such as Duolingo. Um, we make uh, most of their bilingual podcasts and with Ted and Spotify making doc original documentaries, but also adapting content pretty early on. Um, I'm glad that Manny uh, pointed out that distinction. Um, we came on as partners like with Vice News and then um, later with Spotify and more recently with Reveal and with Cancion Exploder, which is a spinoff of Song Exploder and um, with the Rebel Girls uh, series for kids and family. Um, making adaptations into Spanish language um, or multiple languages. Um, one of our documentaries for Spotify, we made in five languages. Um, and so we very quickly saw this need for this adaptation that is far beyond just translating, but really rethinking the underlying content and audio for a new audience. And how do you present it to this new audience? How do you re-edit it? Maybe you do new, new interviews. And so that has become one of our... Um, sort of verticals, so to speak. Um, and in more recent, um, more recently started making original podcasts, um, really targeting Latin America at first, um, even though we're US based, our team is um, very representative of Latin America and spread across um, both all of the Americas. Uh, and then more recently have come to try to um, tackle the US Latino market. I think it's trickier <laughs> than Latin American markets. Um, but obviously being based here and thinking that everything we make from this moment on will always be made in both languages, in English and Spanish. We just think it's a it's a no-brainer that we need to think of uh, Latinos and Latin Americans who want to access our content and our stories um, in both languages. And then also branching out into Portuguese, which has been um, a big... Um, a big expansion for us in the last year. I want to come back to that difficulty, but uh, let's hear from Camila first about your Yeah. Area. So Sonoro, uh, we were uh, sort of started in 2020, so right with the pandemic. Um, but we produce original content across fiction. So we have original 
fiction limited series, um, nonfiction, both sort of investigations, um, but also more are always on research driven shows um, and chat shows. So interview style, round table, all of that. Um, we have the number one uh, independent podcast network in Mexico and Latin America. Um, and we've also sort of launched original series uh, started in Mexico as well, sort of as Martina said, we were really focused in Spanish language in the beginning. Um, but since sort of late uh, or early 21, I should say, we've sort of branched out into the US and sort of this bilingual uh, launches as well. So launching shows both only in English or in English and Spanish at the same time. Um, and our team has grown to around 70 people across LA, New York and Mexico City. And we've worked with um, Latino creators from over 14 different countries, both in the US and abroad. So we're really excited about, you know, really focusing on or be having, I guess, having the privilege of focusing on a global Latino audience and being able to explore those nuances while acknowledging with the rest of the folks here that it is, of course, very tricky. <laughs> yeah, so say more about that. And, uh, you know, Martina was making, and I'll come to you, Martina, but that the Latin American audiences are sometimes easier than the US Spanish speaking. Why? Curious about that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I can start off. I think for for us, uh, it's sort of a little bit the the place the market's in. And I think Martina sort of mentioned that um, a bit earlier, right? Like Mexico and Latin America in general, it's earlier days for podcasting. So, you know, when you have companies like ours that put in a lot of effort into making something that's great, um, you know, odds are that'll stand out because it's just the discoverability is easier, you know, just to be super transparent. And so in the US, you know, you're targeting an underserved audience that you want to reach to. And, you know, discoverability, I think, for podcasting can be really tricky in general, um, while at the same time getting them to podcasting. And I think Edison is a great sort of, um, we love that that survey every year also. And like, I think that's showing that more and more of us are coming to the podcast space, but it is sort of like a, a twofold job of making great stuff that's going to resonate both with, like I said, our, like for Sonoro, our core audience of those second, third generational bicultural Latinos, and also a sort of broader US audience, while also being making sure that people know it's there, right? And that know that there are podcasts now being made for them and by them. Um, so I think that that sort of double education, I think is maybe what makes it a bit trickier. Martina, anything to add on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. The discoverability is is much harder. I mean, there's some incredible qualitative video, like part of the research that Edison did with um, Spanish dominant podcast listeners. And so many of them said that it's impossible to, they didn't even know Spanish podcasts existed. It's impossible to find them. You know, it's, if you open any of the platforms, you're going to be marketed based on your IP address being in the United States, and it's going to be in English. Like it used to be easier to surf around different countries in the platforms and like, just see what are the top podcasts in Colombia or Mexico, much harder now. And I just don't think the technology is set up for us multilinguals. Like it's just, it's not. And um, so first of all, you're just not marketed it <laughs> and there's way more podcasts here. So um, much harder to break through the noise, um, unfortunately. Absolutely. And also just, I want to go back to like the Latino concept. It's just, that is also tricky. You know, it is a, an umbrella term that we have adopted uh, and use, uh, but it's also, we're not a monolith, right? And so if you really start breaking down the that term into its parts, um, people are going to listen and have different, you know, connections to different countries. So the content really has to be specific and really well thought out for the type of Latino that you're trying to reach. It can't just be Latinos. Like I just, and when anyone says, oh, we want to make a po X podcast for Latinos. I'm like, which ones? <laughs> That's my, always my follow-up. <laughs> yeah. Manny, how about you? What do you want to add to that? Uh, a lot and nothing, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> because that's kind of where we tend to fall. It, and I think within programming, and again, this is a, a masterclass, so I want to get a little bit tactical as well. There's mm -hmm. always been a discussion about where is the Hispanic Tyler Perry, right, that can create a bunch of content that resonates with a specific audience. And it's not George Lopez, right? It's not somebody that is known because of all the nuances around it. So taking that like larger view and taking it down to a little bit more of a tactical approach, what I have learned in working with my producers, and I would love for my colleagues to talk about this as well, is the focus. And Martina touched on this a little bit, right? Like 
for me, um, story, story, story. And Camila can talk about this because this is a lot of the discussions that we have of whether something is uh, for us, by us, or for us, by everyone, and in what language it's in. But initially, I had a lot of uh, approaches with people that had these great ideas with binaural sound design and all of the great things that we're gonna, they were going to do. And what we learned very early on, specifically with this type of audience, is that if you have a noise that's slightly distracting and you lose the customer, there's so much out there that they can be listening to that once you lose them at that point, they're not gonna come back, right? Because there is such a broad offering. So when I go back to my creators, writers, producers, et cetera, I'm like, look, I'm gonna listen to what you submit to me on my crappy laptop. I'm not putting headphones on. I'm not putting anything on that's gonna embellish any of the sound. If the story doesn't captivate me, we have to rework it, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. That's something that has helped break some of these things through, like the Hano that comes from Sonoro and some of the great productions that Adonde Media has done. They've broken through because they have unique stories that people want to hear. And I think that's a lesson. Look, I'm not telling you anything that people don't know already, but it's a matter of focus a lot more on your writing writing than um, potentially working on your sound design. And sound design is amazing. I'm not going to knock it. But I, 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 if you want to just tell me a story on my laptop without any sound design, I'll be happy to hear it without necessarily telling you, OK, I think I need a screech of a car here and curb going. That also really helps a lot. But it's really don't don't lose me. And that helps yeah. kind of break through a little bit. How do you say content is king in Spanish? Because <laughs> <laughs> I go to the bank on that premise, you know, that the content is everything. And it's so it's, of course, true in, in these markets as well. Um, I want to turn a little bit to the difficulties between handling translation uh, versus adaptation of materials in these markets. Can you guys speak a little bit specifically to some of the the challenges you faced in different regions with different audiences and and talk about translation and you know what you think about there versus adaptation there must be different rules and maybe start with you martina yeah i mean an interesting case we had was adapting um reveals uh investigation of uh, the ayotzinapa disappearances in mexico so obviously they made they had a ton of, uh, it was like a two-year investigation. All of their interviews entire, almost entirely were in Spanish. Some were in English um, with Spanish speakers. So um, they came to, to us with a, a ton of material and they just said, look, we're going to have to spend so much time explaining this to the, an American audience where they're, you know, there's so many things that we discovered that would be interesting to a Mexican audience and you could use this material in such a more interesting way. Um, that was a, an interesting one because Ayotzinapa, I mean, that word uh, is recognizable around the world based on when those disappearances happened and the incredible marches and um, protests that, that unleashed uh, with those disappearances. Um, so we thought, oh, this is a no brainer. It's going to be really interesting across Latin America. But what happens when you adapt is you have to choose. <laughs> and so we chose Mexicans. We're like, no, 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 we're going to make this for Mexicans. So we edited out all of that explanation, all the things that would be like talking down to a Mexican audience because they know this case. They, we don't have to go into the nitty gritty. Um, obviously, we had to make a choice. And so that and we had a Mexican host, which is a really a prominent investigative reporter. And we redid those interviews that were done in sort of, you know, broken English. We redid them with the Spanish speakers in their native language and um, and took the investigation even a little bit further because we were coming to the material later. Um, all that being said, it really ended up being a majority. It was just listened to by Mexicans, mostly more than anyone else. Of course, it was very respected and, and well received uh, by other podcasters around uh, the, the the Spanish speaking world. But that was one of those situations where um, in adapting, I think you really do have to think about who you're going to target almost more than in the original. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a choice that you're going to have to make. And we try at Adonde to make things, I love how Camila put it, like that they're, they're specific, they're unique, 
but appeal to universal stories and the human condition. Um, and so to do both of those things in a way that you make a story that could be about a bank heist in Argentina, but be super interesting and engaging for someone in Spain, um, it comes from the story itself and the way you approach it from the very, 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 very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, not enough time to do that mm -hmm. in an adaptation situation. So that's one of our lessons. I, I could talk about this forever, <laughs> but I'll let uh, Camila take it from there. Yeah, Camila. Yeah, no, I think that was, I mean, in our experience in doing nonfiction, I mean, you nailed it, right? Like I think from the interviews to how, if you're gonna dub or if you're just gonna explain, like I think it's a really complex process. And um, I think you said it really, really well. I would say for the fiction side, um, it's a bit of an easier process, although you still have to put some extra work in, right? Like I think when we're working with script writers, obviously they have a preference to English or Spanish. Um, when we're adapting, you know, we have a few shows that are based in, in Miami. I would say when we're adapting shows from there, for example, that the writer was really well versed in the English language and sort of nailed the scripts there and we want to make it into Spanish. We're on both the scripting and the casting side, really cognizant of the accents you want to hear when you're in Miami, right? Like I think when we're casting a Spanish language show in Miami, those actors are going to hail from different countries and in LA or in New York or in Chicago. So, you know, on I guess similar to nonfiction, perhaps when you're looking for hosts, I think on the fiction side, like we're pretty mindful of making sure those characters and those stories sound like the city they're in whether that's the us or abroad because i think that sometimes um i mean even in dubbing honestly like on on tv that's where you sort of see like well i don't know if this person would speak this way or have this accent um and it sort of takes you out of it um so i think for me that's when we're really working on adapting on the fiction side that's sort of the biggest um, those are the biggest things we're watching out for is slang, what they're actually going to say, if they're going to be sp speaking in English or in Spanish naturally, and, and what sort of accents you're, you're listening to. Cool. Manny, Manny, anything to add? A couple of things, mostly present company excluded, but some of the producers that I've worked with that are now trying to produce things in English and Spanish to be released at the same time. Uh, I would say there are some pitfalls that are involved and going to back what Martina said, you have to make a choice. Uh, what I have learned in working with uh, these production companies, these producers and these partners is like, choose a language. And I think uh, Camila alluded to this in terms of the preference of the writers and the script writers, like give me the most authentic piece of work in whatever language you're gonna choose to do it in. And then we can work together on the adaptation. Right. If you try to do it at the same time, it's hard for the creative mind not to be thinking about when you're writing something in Spanish, how it might come across in English, and that will impact your actual work. So what I try to advise is like, please tell your writers, don't even think about the fact that this is coming out in English, don't even go there, or don't even think about the fact that this is coming out in Spanish. Let's just get a solid script in one language first, and then we can work together on something that we're gonna produce and how it's gonna be produced. And that's not gonna be a straight translation in another language, whichever language it might be. And I've had productions in seven, done in seven languages already, and I don't understand all of them, but they've had to have a lot of different components put in the sound design in different areas. And some have worked well and some haven't worked as well. So it's it's just really a matter of just, again, content being game, but just nailing one language the way you want it initially. And maybe it's not, uh, uh, it's it's something that I would strongly advise. You can try it other, another way, but that's mainly the only thing I would have. So if, if you're putting together a Spanish language piece of content, let's say you picked your market and you know it's going to go out in English, are you, so it sounds like you are localizing for English too, or are you just doing a straight kind of like literal translation of English? I guess it depends on the product or... Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. I think, you know, we've had shows that, again, on, I'll speak to, to fiction just to be practical about it. Like if, if it takes place, for example, in Mexico City and we want to adapt it to English, we might move it to Arizona or to California. And like, that's part of that adaptation, right? And like, it doesn't have to take place in the, we're already changing the scripts. So I think we can really make it as true to the story and the characters as we want it to be. And, and the same thing could, put, again, it's project to project, right? But I think it, that sometimes works well too when we're going the other way around. English to Spanish, depending on the city, 
stuff could happen in both languages in Miami or in LA or, or New York, right? So I think we're, we're just trying to have it be as specific to the place as we can be while telling, you know, these great stories. Yeah. I'll chime in to just say that one thing yeah. that we did to localize under a lot of pressure because we had very little time, we were going to release um, a documentary in five different languages uh, for Spotify about um, the last days of Diego Maradona's life. So to localize something, I mean, I totally agree with Manny, you got to make the original first. And so we were basically yeah. doing, we did the first three episodes in Spanish, then we started the adaptation teams. And so adaptation teams were like, a month or three episodes behind, you could say. Um, and we just, it wasn't enough time to localize, like, I mean, we tried on the accents of like the, the, the voiceovers. Um, but what really made the difference there was the host. And so we made, we, you know, if you think of your audience and where are they going to hook themselves with the content? Um, I thought that was a brilliant idea on behalf of our client Spotify to say, okay, each adaptation will have a host that is a prominent voice for that audience in that language on soccer and Diego Maradona. And so that host then adapted the script and put their own little anecdotes in there. And that what became the adaptation, if so to speak. Um, and so just to say that for other creators out there, there are different ways to adapt content to make it hook your audience a little bit more, but just come at it from your audience perspective and their user experience. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Manny. Do you have the only add? thing I would add to that is um, treat your audience as somebody, uh, treat them with respect. And, and let me explain the context behind this. Don't think that they will tune out is something obvious to stated up front. And um, Camila spoke about fiction and how that works. And Martina talked a little bit about the Maradona thing, which is, is nonfiction. A lot of the content that's performed well on our service for our audiences has been documentary style stories that feature some sort of triumph of the human spirit. And the way we've adapted those is to try to maintain as much authenticity in the story as possible. Um, by doing simple things, right? Straight out front saying, listen, this was initially done in Spanish. And in order for you to feel the authenticity of this in English, we're gonna play you a little bit of the Spanish first so you hear their voices and then we're gonna pop them down and you'll hear the English adaptation. So that's what I mean in terms of treating with respect by saying, don't think that because something has some Spanish in it, someone's gonna tune out, like just let them know up front, right? This is something yeah. that is being adapted. This is something that we want you to a story that we feel is important for you to listen to and we want to bring it to you in the most authentic way. Um, and then another additional tiny twist that I want to throw out there, try about, talk about adapting from Spanish to Spanish, right? From like Iberian Spanish to <laughs> Latin American and vice versa. So that's just like throwing another <laughs> twist into the whole thing in terms of the localizations, et cetera, which we all take, I think, into consideration. Nice, nice. Um, one of our uh, audience members, Lori Martinez, posed my next question, which was to go into marketing a little bit. How does how do these bilingual shows? How do you think about marketing them? I mean, are there specific rules for different regions that that you have, Camila? I might start with you there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's sort of similar to the adaptation and i think like i'll just be it's also like it's a difficult process and you're sort of learning as you go i think too right i think for us um similar to the language there's always one that leads on the marketing as well right like if there was a story that in nonfiction was reported out in mexico we're probably going to put you know most of our efforts to where it took place um that's just in terms of how we allocate sort of our resources and where we want to do our ad buys, things like that. Um, but I think for the most part, it's we're sort of again hinging back on those universal elements. Like we're obviously going to target um, the local areas with messaging and with maybe parts of the story that we know will particularly gravitate towards. Like again, this example: Mexicans listening in Mexico versus Mexican Americans listening in California. We're going to tweak what they might be interested in or have more explanation for certain areas based on that on the marketing side as well. But ultimately, if it's, you know, we had this project with Futuro about Chalino Sanchez, like, I think like there's a lot of universal elements of that story that are both the figure of himself as a musician, the sort of crime elements, the music elements, those are all things that are interesting universally and globally. 
And so I think in terms of, you know, not trying to make things too hard for ourselves and we're marketing things in many different countries, it's trying to first figure out what are those pieces of the stories that are universally impactful and interesting, really leaning on those. And then, you know, for the assets that we can sort of distinguish by country, which are typically, you know, dynamic ads or maybe social that we sort of promote in in specific areas, then we'll maybe try to make it a bit more specific and obviously in terms of the language and sort of what we're highlighting. But it goes back to to that idea of universality and like what are the themes that we're telling that are going to interest anyone because ultimately like it's a great story period um and really trying to focus on those anything to add either of you yeah um i i think it's um we're i mean i i want to just put out there's also i don't know if camille you were hinting at this it's like we're we're all making it up <laughs> like wait, this is not oh yeah for sure it's not like a written playbook yet like we're yeah. all experimenting right so um you know, we had discussed maybe uh, pointing out a couple foibles, but like, I would just say the thing is, as we all experiment, I think we're learning. And like, one of the things that um, I've seen happen over and over again is companies going the extra distance to make something in two languages, but then marketing it the same. And I think that's a big, big problem. Um, We really need to remember these are different audiences. Um, I am personally not a fan of putting two different languages in one stream, for example, in one RSS feed. I think that's confusing a messaging to your audience. Um, I think they should be separate and considered separately. You can do the same artwork, use the same original music, but they're different audiences. Um, and unless you're truly going for that bilingual audience that speaks both Spanish and English and you're giving them an option on which one they want to listen to in the same feed. Um, so you know, I think it's just important to respect that they're different. And in terms of marketing, um, we were a little newer to the game. Uh, we just started releasing originals this year, but um, things that we've learned is that we're accepting the fact that we're uh, targeting people who might not know about podcasts yet. And so that's a big thing. We're going off podcasts, platforms and off podcast general listenership to find our listeners. And so we go to the content, right? So um, if we can find niche Reddit groups or Facebook groups or communities that are already connecting as fans around this particular story or like in terms of Chalito, like probably like corridos, narco corridos, like just go to the content and the people who are fans of that content and let them know that there's a podcast. You might be letting them know what a podcast is. Um, But the fact is we have to go off platform to start bringing people to the medium. And that's just a fact of Spanish language listening right now. Um, Mm -hmm. And that helps you get around the SEO uh, issue you raised earlier, I would assume. In A, a little bit. I mean, you know, yeah. the fact that YouTube has continuously been a top platform for, you know, reported as a top platform for listening is it's part of our marketing. Like we put all our episodes up there uh, with subtitles. So yeah. we it's a double dip. We're like, oh, hey, if you don't speak super good Spanish, you can go to YouTube and read along as you listen. Um, and we get people who have never listened to a podcast and they're like, I love this, but I have no idea what it is. Where do I get more of it? <laughs> they just discovered it through YouTube, you know? Yeah. 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 Manny, what, what has Audible learned in, in that realm? A fair amount, uh, having the advantage of working at a corporation that has marketing budgets and is able to take proposals from different types of agencies that, or different types of vendors that would like to have those marketing budgets to reach the audiences, you get to see a lot of different pitches and approaches. And what we've learned is very marketing 101, right? Like find the audience where they are. And I think Latina basically alluded to that already. These are inherently digital experiences. Um, As such, digital platforms have yielded some of the best results for some of our campaigns, which is social, which was alluded to, which is video, which was alluded to, which is SEO to some degree, you get the more traditional media companies with a lot of their information coming in and saying, we are the biggest Spanish language network in the world. As such, you need to be with us for the following reasons. And we don't really see a lot of movement from those campaigns because it is likely that the audiences that we want to listen to our productions to go and download our app, which is an inherently digital activity, are not capable of, are interested in, or want to do something like that, likely because they're busy looking at connected audiovisual programming. So for us, 
what's worked very well has not necessarily from a content marketing standpoint, but just from a product standpoint, it's available. You can find content in language here. Here are some of the things you might want to check out. And also here are some titles through the advantage of having audiobooks that you might recognize as something that you might have read or heard about. So promoting those things together has really helped out. So I, I understand that there's a lot of differences here. And I think somebody like Camila with their experience, because we understand their model more, they under they put packages together that include marketing. So they think about some of these components to see how to reach the audience where they are. And it, it, it really, it comes down to like, you, you go to your first marketing class for your freshman year at university and they're like, find the audience where it is, where, where are you gonna buy a sweater? Well, where, when they go out shopping for one, et cetera, target audience market. Yeah. Where it's cold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, cold. it's also like, remember, I think I'm sure they say this in marketing class, like just the many touch points you have to have. Like, I think they need to hear about podcasts and maybe your podcast eight times before they're going to be yeah. like, oh my God, I've heard about this podcast so much. I'm just going to go look for it because it's a real big action we're asking. You know, uh -huh. it's a big ask. It's not yeah. like they have a little, like a link right when they hear about it. No, they have to go look for it. They need to have an app to look for. They need to know where to find it. Like really understanding the plight of our future listener, I think is key to getting them to listen. <laughs> um, I'm just going to pause for a minute and see if there are any questions, uh, more questions. Uh, this has been just so fascinating uh, to me. Certainly, I'm learning a ton. Um, anyone out there wants to to pipe in? Um, uh, yeah, and I, I think I like that, Martina, you did talk about the foibles, some of the foibles that people have made. And I was wondering if Manny or uh, Camila have other examples of of things that, uh, oh, there's a, a q and A. I'll, I'll hold on that. Let's see. I'll go back here from uh, I'm not seeing it. I apologize. Maybe she could restate it. I see it. Do you want me to okay. read it? Yes, please. It's from Elaine Grant. Yes. She's I interviewing like a host of a show for Latino professionals in the U.S. on Friday. Can we talk about making choices for finding and growing a specific Latino audience, good things to do, and mistakes a Latino producer might be making? She'd also mm -hmm. love to know if you have an English language podcast and want to create a version in another language. How do you find and choose a host? Especially when you don't speak the language. I think that's pretty oh. good question. Jamila, I'll give you the first part of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, we on the marketing side, sort of like we were just saying, I think it's it's about finding the audience where they are, right? I want to reiterate what Martina mentioned about YouTube. I think in particular for Latin America, I mean, it's, it's I can't over, like overstate how important that is, even if it's not necessarily a moving video, like literally putting the audio up there with your logo and subtitles, people will listen to that in, in its entirety. So I think like that is definitely, um, a hack in terms of growing and finding new audiences when specifically in Latin America. Um, yeah, and I think ultimately, like, it's, it's also about working within the world we're all in, right? Like putting your podcast and other podcasts, depending on what the format is, right? Whether that's, you know, if you don't have any marketing budget, it's as simple as reaching out maybe to your favorite podcaster and doing a, a promo swap, um, or if it's uh, an interview style show, you know, going and guesting on other podcasts and vice versa. I think going back to the bread and butter of how we all built this community, right? You know, way back when, um, I think it's still really, really impactful. And ultimately, like for people that you already know or for audiences you already know are listening to podcasts, going to other podcasts is is the best way to get there. And then obviously finding them outside of the podcast world, you know, we talked a little bit about sort of the YouTube and social of it all um, and really honing those strategies. Right. Um, Martina, do you want to talk about host? How do you find and choose a host when you're creating yeah. something? I mean, I think the key word here is collaboration. Um, you know, there are many bilinguals like us on this call who uh, you can hire uh, to be your consultant um, and help you find uh, a good host. So don't just think that you're going to be able to figure out this, if the Spanish is good enough. Like that's, you don't have to, it's okay. Like that you don't know. Um, and I think that that's like really hard for us creators, especially when we're adapting a show that we've poured so much of ourselves into. And it's like, oh, I, I can't trust another person to choose the voice of this show in another language. And it's like, you know, you're going to have to, if you want to do it right. Um, I'm actually about to make a show in Mandarin 
I do not speak oh. Mandarin. Um, <laughs> I interviewed a bunch of people who happened to speak Mandarin and English. And I found a very awesome professional who's going to help me choose our host. And it's about trust. So collaboration and trust and understanding that um, there are plenty of people out there who you can hire to help you. And so it's going to just take you know some extra resources, but that's that's definitely what I would what I, where I would start. Uh, Manny, I'm going to kick this one to you uh, from Tatiana Her Heredia. Sorry for pronunciation. How do you see the future of podcast vis-a-vis -vis video podcast in the Spanish speaking market? Well, going back to what we were talking about before in terms of where the audiences are, um, it's interesting. What What is a video podcast if not a TV show, right? Potentially an audiovisual show. However, you do have nuances around it in terms of engaging audiences on platforms like YouTube and, and coming from that company and knowing how they uh, chose their um, to work with different influencers and different content creators. This was about seven years ago when content creator was just a term that was coming up. It is interesting to see that there isn't a science there either. All right, it's a matter of understanding how they're targeting and engagement tools work out um, and how you can actually engage the audience where they are consuming the content and how it does well. Now, in terms of video podcasting, a lot of this happens in, has happened in what, what we call traditional radio where uh, syndicated hosts have taken and filmed themselves doing interviews and release that. If you start putting a lot more production into it, then you're really talking more about how you want to potentially license it out to be something that's audiovisual. So my, I think it has potential, but there's a lot of different mediums that have a lot of visual content. What makes this audio content kind of distinct right now is the experiences we're giving somebody that is allowing them not just to multitask, but to think about things differently as they're having an experience at the same time. As it's a little bit more difficult to do, and from a production standpoint, um, you might get, it's a little bit more expensive. So if you want, it's a, a lot easier to do start something with audio and then think about how to adapt it later. And I don't know if necessarily that answered the question. I just, I, I think that there are a lot of different lanes to go in with this and it's a, a newer world. And I, I haven't seen anything that has been necessarily super successful in that vein, uh, except for some of these like spiritual, Interest, another interesting genre for those Latinos, Latin, a, Latin Americans is like spiritual, religious kind of content does really well. That tends to do well in, in a visual because there's a lot of things that you want to see and how the audience is, uh, how the, the hosts and stuff are reacting. But I think it is a smaller niche right now. There's probably some development of it coming and it's going to have to take a different format that the streamers are doing and we have to think about what the pricing is at as well because there's so many services out there and and you know people only have limited amount of funds to see how many of the things they want to subscribe to yeah interesting um so we have another question from patrick hyde um uh, martina maybe do you think there's a market for historical fiction podcasts like ava longoria's sisters of the underground do they have to be star driven maybe camila can weigh in as well um Sure. I mean, I think there's a market for almost anything. It's funny. We did the first edition of the Latino podcast listener report. Um, true crime was like super low and in the, in the rankings of, of types of podcasts people like to listen to. And I saw that as like a, Oh, we need to make more true crime. It wasn't like a, Oh, they don't like it. No, they don't know about it. There's just not enough being made. Um, so I think absolutely historical fiction podcast. I love historical fiction. I personally would be a listener. Um, but no, I don't think they need to be star driven. This is like a really like goes against the grain of what we've been hearing in uh, the industry and from many clients and stuff. But um, the last listener report pretty much put it in writing like it. They don't care. They just want it to be interesting to them and to be um, a topic that speaks to them. And so at least self-reporting um, 
you know, people who were surveyed uh, for the listen report said it's not that interesting to them for it to just have um, a celebrity voicing it. And I think because now, I mean, maybe that was true in the beginning when celebrity voice, you know, driven podcasts were more new and and interesting. Every every celebrity has a podcast now, so it better be good. Like it's just that's I think that's all it needs to be good now. It can't just be the voice of someone famous. Yeah, yeah, Camila, do you concur? Yeah, I, I concur. I mean, we work with a lot of really great actors in our shows, but I think the it sort of hints to what we've all been saying that like the writing and the sound design all has to be there to support the talent and the talent has to be really excited. Um, and like that enthusiasm shines through when they get in the studio. So I think like we do love working with talent mm -hmm. that's recognizable again on the discoverability. It may, I think it, maybe it still does help. It really, it's hard to say, honestly. Um, but I think it has to be supported by the story being there and being interested and engaging by the talent being actually really excited to be there and be a part of it. And the sound design being um, sort of up to snuff as well. And on the historical fiction one, I think definitely one of our most successful podcasts in Latin America, Toxicomania, was based in the 40s. And we sort of sound designed it to match sort of the music and the, you know, the vehicles that would have been around at the time in Mexico in that time period. And I think Again, it's just about that accuracy, like with anything else, right? Of language, of time period. Period is hard, but I think you can definitely pull it off. Do the research, yeah. Yeah. Uh, two more, time for two more questions, I think. Uh, Manny, do your mm. Spanish language podcast aimed at Latin American audiences tend to have much success in Spain? It depends. It's a great question. It it if going back to the story, what we have seen that has succeeded in Spain is nonfiction documentary style stories, triumph of the human spirit type of stuff. If we try to have fiction in a Latin American neutral accent play in Spain, it doesn't do as well because studies have shown that we've run and, and that uh, maybe Martina can also speak to is that Spanish audiences tend to prefer Iberian accents in their productions. So for them, it's almost like a I won't call it a concession, but to listen to a Latin American accent is completely driven by the interest of the content. Now, interestingly enough, we just released something in English that took place uh, in Spain during Franco's regime that is doing very well in the US. And we just did this last week where we made it available in Spain to see how something like that performs because we'd like to see what perspective somebody in another country has of a production that is done about their country in, in somewhere else in another language and how that authenticity can be brought in if there's something there that we could play with as well. So um, like I said, most of the stuff that I produce, the stuff that's done the best in Spain and has gotten the most highlights has been in the nonfiction realm, inclusive of self-development down to documentary style. So things that people can learn from will and 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 um, not just learn from, but also be able to take an action in their own lives or be inspired by tend to have a universal kind of appeal. Great, great. Um, I think I'm being asked to pause there because we're running out of time. It's four more minutes. Um, uh, Rosie, I guess we are gonna post your question later. Uh, I wanted to thank the panelists here. I think this was an amazing conversation. We get a lot of very positive notes um, from our uh, from our folks here. And uh, I'm not sure if Amanda's coming back in to say hi and say something official, but- um, <laughs> uh, That's my cue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. anything else yeah. you wanna say? I just want to thank everybody for being here. Camila, Manny, Martina, it has been a pleasure. Martha, I always learn so much from your excellent facilitation. And I got to tell you, all the questions that were submitted from our amazing audience members were so on point. And I'm sure there's so many more. I noticed that um, Tatiana had asked about the future of video podcasting, which I think video podcasting is the next frontier, if you will, that um, as folks have named, you know, it's not like there's a rule book or a playbook. It really is about the art of podcasting. There yeah. is science involved, of course. Yeah, man, I think man, um, did a good job on that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. 
So, yeah. um, sorry, I forgot to dismiss that. And no. um, for everybody who joined us again, I wanted to welcome you to TPA. You are part of our informal network, but if you want to make it official, just go ahead and I'm going to repaste the message I put in the chat about how you can sign up. If you're an independent podcaster or you're somebody who says my voice is not well represented in podcasting, we actually have a special application for a free first year of membership here. And even if not, if you've been a live attendee and here I see you all, thank you for being here and you're not a TPA member, you'll be emailed a promo code for 50% off your first podcast academy membership year, which is $50, 50%, $50. I'll let you do the math there. Um, <laughs> folks, again, I want to plus 100 to everything that people have said. Um, Tatiana says, I love the power of audio. This has been a powerful discussion. And again, I might um, wish everybody a wonderful, wonderful um, Native American Indigenous <laughs> Heritage Month here in North America specifically the U.S. And I want to wish everybody the best on your enterprise. I saw a lot of really cool ideas being shared in the chat. So we celebrate you. Last but certainly not least, if you are um, producing a podcast and there's episodes out, do not be shy about submitting your podcast for an Ambies, uh, a nomination because the process grants you new audience members and listeners. And you also get feedback, which I think is also a great value add. I think that's it, Martha. Do anything yeah. else to say before we close this out? Thanks to my awesome colleagues here. You guys rock. So thank you so much. Thanks, Amanda. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us. us. Thanks, everyone. Have Take care. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Muchas gracias. Bye. Bye.